so I want to talk about um, a little a little about the interplay between combinatorics and algebraic geometry, and um, usually this this is focused on applications of algebraic geometry tools to to, to combinatorics, at least in in this in this side of the topic. Um, however, I want to really use I want to I want to start by this. I want to um, give you the applications um, to combinatorics at the start, and then for the most part of these Hadamard lectures, I will actually tell you how combinatorial tools are used to prove actually theorems in algebraic geometry, and specifically um, theorems of the decomposition theorem type, hard left shades type, and Hodge Riemann relations, and some. Some things that are variants of, of, of Hodge-Riemann relations um, that only pop up when you try to prove hard left shed theorem beyond, um, beyond positivity, so for varieties that are not projective. Um, so there are rather few people in the room that will give, that will try to ask questions, but now if there's anything from the remote audience, um, please interrupt me right away, okay? Okay, so today it's overview and applications. Um, and let me start actually um, with the second word of the title. Let me start with the applications, just to keep you motivated. And then I will uh, tell you where in algebraic geometry they come from. So, application number one pertains to matroids. So, matroids and characteristic polynomials. And other invariants of matroids in the end. Um, and the point here is, well, associated to a matroid, which is an abstraction of, of, of the concept of linear independence in, in vector spaces, we can, we can, we can think about um, things like the, the characteristic polynomial or things like we could count the number of independent sets of a given size. We could also look at another special case of matroids, which is, comes from graphs, and then we could look at the chromatic polynomial. And there are all kinds of invariants that are interesting here. And usually the question is, well, what kind of shape do these, do these invariants take? And without actually defining matroids, let me just state two special cases. So one is, if I look at the chromatic polynomial of a graph, of a graph. Um, that is the polynomial counting the number of vertex colorings, so proper vertex colorings of the, um, of the graph with n colors. Well, first of all, it's not clear that this is a polynomial. That's not hard to prove, and I think Birkhoff did it in the end. Um, but once you know that it's a polynomial, well, you can ask about its coefficients, right? And um, what shape does it do the coefficients take? What shapes do the zeros take? Can you repeat so you consider the number of ways to color what? Yes, okay. So the chromatic polynomial, first of all, the chromatic function is the number of colorings of the graph of the graph with t colors. You mean you color the edges? Um, okay, so let me here, so this is vertex colorings, vertex coloring, and it's, it's supposed to be proper, meaning that no two adjacent vertices get the same color. So, I can do this in orange, I can then do this in orange, but for this vertex I have to use another color. 
and then you have, an, you have to use another color. Yellow is not, maybe not the bad choice. Okay, that's the coloring. And I count them, right? And then I, as I said, it's not quite obvious. I mean, that immediately there is a polynomial, but it turns out to be a polynomial, all right? The way that you can prove this is by a recursion relation. So what you cannot, well, how do you compute the chromatic polynomial for this? Well, here's a simple trick. So you could count the number. Um, you can use the inclusion exclusion formula. Yes, yes, yes. It's a deletion contraction, right? So I could take an edge, I could remove it, right? And, um, and then um, I could, so I could have, so I have the colorings of this graph, right? So now there's, there's this edge missing here, right? And then, of course, I overcounted because I counted also those colorings where those two get the same. So I um, deduct from this the contraction of that edge, right? So now I kind of, I moved this, this vertex into this vertex. I contracted this, I identified the two. And then it's, okay, so now, now you basically reduce it to the graphs on one vertex, and then you're done. That's, that's the way that you get to a polynomial, all right? And that's one case that is interesting. Here's another case that is, is very nice. So if I, if I have a configuration of vectors in some vector space, I could count the number of independent sets of size i, all right, in this vector configuration. All right, so I could have, all right, uh, fi, so v vector configuration, um, in, or maybe I shouldn't use v, in, in some vector space, x, maybe I just should turn it around, and then I could look at the sequence fi, which is the number of independent sets in V of size I. All right. Um, and in this sort of context, one is often interested in log concavity. So, the coefficients of the, co the characteristic polynomial AI or the coefficients or the, these numbers FI, um, they, often, they often turn out, or they, they, I mean, you do some examples, they turn out to be log concave, meaning that if I square an entry, then it is larger, equal to the product of the two adjacent entries. All right, that's log concavity. Um, and that's the first sort of theorem that I want to talk about. Um, Chromatic polynomials have non-negative coefficients here. Um, they have alternating coefficients, I think. I yeah, but so that for the uh, for the log concavity, that does not matter. Um, this one does uh, not. Well, this one is positive coefficients. Um, so that's the one th one sort of combinatorial property one is interested in. And this is uh, in this world of matroids. Um, convex geometers like um, Jan might also recognize this as, well, this looks suspiciously like Alexandra Fentiel. And we will in fact see that this is somehow, in some sense, is a special case of a version of Alexandra Fentiel. Of Alexandra Fentiel. Alexandra Fentiel inequalities? It's in convex geometry, so that's why I said the convex geometers might remember this. Um, this is one sort of question that I'm interested in. Here's another, and actually I think this one is, uh, right, it's, it comes in the middle, but I think this one is a favorite, but you have to hide what's a, whatever is your most favorite. So here's um, um, a simple problem, right? So I have delta a simplicial complex. Um, and now I want to embed this into some vector space, 
All right. What is interesting? Well, let's say if it's a k-dimensional simplicial complex, then the most interesting space to embed it to um, to start with would be um, a two k-dimensional space, All right? Because then. Um, really, the obstructions are purely in the k-dimensional faces, right? They, somehow, if there are too many, you expect that they intersect in some way transversally, all right? Um, and that is indeed uh, kind of the, the right question to ask. And, um, well, we could ask then, okay, so the simplest one would be um, we have a k-dimensional complex. Um, and we embed delta into our 2k. In an, okay, so um, you, can, you, can, you can embed this in a topological way. Unfortunately, we, somehow, the methods that I will discuss um, don't quite work if the map is not tame enough. Um, so I have to assume at least that it's piecewise linear or piecewise smooth, or so it should be it should be tame enough. So let me, for purposes of being specific, let me just restrict to PL maps. So it doesn't have to be linear on every face, right? But it should be you should be able to break it into linear. You can break the faces further, and then it is piecewise linear. Okay, that's a question. Um, and then you can ask, well, how many how many faces could there be? Right? Well, it's, I mean, the, the critical question is, um, right? How many k-dimensional faces could there be in terms of lower-dimensional faces? So, uh, is there is there a theorem you can do it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. So here's the theorem. Um, in this case, the number of k-dimensional faces of delta is less or equal to the number of k minus one dimensional faces of delta right, um, times k plus two. All right. And um, this is asymptotically tight. So you can add another constant here, but it's an additive constant. So it's plus something to make it tight. All right. And this depends on the dimension, but it doesn't. This is a necessary condition or a sufficient condition? Or? No, 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 no. I mean, you could, ever, you could always take a simplicial complex and make it very dense in some part, and then that part doesn't embed, right? Uh, like a graph you can embed to the plane, yeah, if it contains. Yeah, yeah, if it contains a computer. Right, that, that is the example, right? So, example, right, a graph into the plane, all right, and then and that is a classical result. Then the number of edges um, is less than three times the number of vertices. That's equal to. Okay, that's it. Um, my favorite form of the inequality is and right. Well, this is the first non-trivial case, and it turns out that once you understood that case, you understood everything. And this is if you have a delta and you embed it into R four. Well, then the number of triangles is at most four times the number of edges. All right? Um, it turns out that there's a world of difference between this proving this inequality, which is classical and goes back to Descartes and Euler. I will show you in a second how. And um, the inequality in four dimensional space. And again, yeah, EPL. I mean, here it doesn't matter, it turns out. Um, let me quickly sketch why this is difficult, or why it is easy in the... Um, well, one reason why it is easy in the, in the case of graphs, right? So, um, if you have a graph in the plane, then what you can do is always Right, so you want to count the number of edges, um, and what you can do is always you can add edges until every component of the complement is a triangle, including the component at infinity. All right, so here, right, so this is not um, 
complete. So I could add this, all right? And then I have, well, I could add this edge and then every component is a triangle. And then of course I could use, right? I could use the Euler's formula. And well, I have a simple double counting, right? Uh, three times the number of triangles, all right? We account the number of incidents of triangles and edges is uh, two times the number of edges. And okay, so if you calculate it, you get the desired inequality, that's it, all right? Just put them together and that's it. So, and now you see immediately what the, what the issue is in, um, in dimension, in the, when you embed into dimension four, well, okay, so now you want to add triangles until you have a triangulation of a sphere or something like that. But it turns out that you cannot do this without adding, uh, without adding edges at some point, All right? So you could, there are, there are simplicial complexes of dimension two where you cannot, where, where you, that you cannot turn into the two skeleton of a triangulation of the, of the sphere, let's say, without adding an edge, and then it's no longer monotone, right? Notice that here I really only added edges, right? I only added, I only added to one side of the inequality, and that was uh, the key part. And so that's the, one of the key issues that arises here. Um, and the third application is, um, um, you get, all, you get uh, something like e plus two. Ah, okay, we did with a constant two, but it is three v minus two. You get three v minus two. Yes, yes, I said that somehow. Asymptotically, somehow, the, the linear factor is tight. Okay, so there is an additional, there is a, there is an error term here, but it's an additive error term that I don't care about for the purpose of the talk. And this error term is negative or positive? Or? It's, it's always, ne it's negative. So the inequality as stated is true. Okay. All right? You only get better. <coughs> All right. Also, another reason to write it this way is um, if you think about it, if the number of vertices is very small, then the additive error does not apply, right? If, if you just have one vertex, then you cannot write vertex minus six because there's no edge, but the, the num it would be negative. So you have to be careful with the additive error a little when the graph or the complex is very small. That's another reason not to write it. Um, okay, the last part is, um, well, now we can go to, to um, now we go to triangulations of manifolds. And let us specifically try to understand them, um, not from a topological point of view, but from a combinatorial one. And combinatorialists, again, they like to count things. And so if I have a triangulation of a manifold, let's say a sphere, all right? So here's a triangulation of the one-dimensional sphere, all right? The decomposition into one-dimensional simplices. Um, then I can count the number of um, simplices of a given dimension in this triangulation. So the number of zero dimensional simplices, so F0 is equal to four, and F1 is also equal to four, and then usually you add F minus one, which is just for the empty set, just to make it down closed, and this is equal to one, and this object here, this is the F vector. Okay, so this is a vector that counts how many, how many faces of a given dimension, how many simplices of a given dimension I have in my special complex. And now it's interesting to restrict it topologically. It's, it's, it's an easy problem, or it's a much easier problem if I just don't give any restriction on a special complex. But if I give the, if I give you some interesting topological restrictions, sometimes some suddenly the, the problem becomes very, very, um, very hard and very interesting because it says much more about the geometry of the space in the end. Um, so we ask, well, what is characterization? Um, and the result here is, um, so theorem, the face vectors, so F vectors, 
of simplicial spheres And here I mean in the loosest sense of the word, um, so these are homology manifolds um, whose homology is also equivalent, globally equivalent to the sphere. Okay, so I fix some field K and I want that locally I have the, the, the homology of a sphere and globally I have the homology of a sphere. And that's it. Um, and they are, okay, so they are, here's, a, here's a kind of underhanded way of stating it. Um, they are characterized, are, are realized by um, F vectors of polytopes. And are characterized by a ring condition. By an algebraic condition. Um, let's ignore the last part of the sentence for now. We will start to explain it in a, in a second. But the first part is already interesting because it says that, well, if you want to know the possible, uh, the possible face vectors that you get for simplicial spheres, it doesn't matter whether it's, a, whether it's Poincaré homology sphere or any, others, right, uh, any other homology sphere that you want as wild as you want, if you want to know the face vector, you know already that there is a polytope with the same face vector. I think she's already used this here on the north. Yeah, yeah, the polytope, right, about the it's a ball, so you take the boundary of the ball and that's... But the not simplicial. Ah, I so, I'm sorry. You're right. Thank you, Maxim. Yes. Ah. ah, and Pierre, remind me to repeat questions, actually. I forgot several times what now. What do you mean exactly by polytope? I will write it. Um, so a polytope, and I will restrict mostly to simplicial polytopes. A polytope is just a convex hull of um, a, a number of points in a finite number of points in a vector space, in a real vector space. All right, um, and it's simplicial. Well, if the boundary of this polytope um, is decomposed into simplices, or equivalently, if you can, um, if you can just put, if you, if the vertices are in general position. Right? So if you can move the vertices a little without changing the combinatorics of the polytope. So for instance, the cube, right? So the, the cube, not this cube, but the cube um, in dimension three is not a simplicial polytope, right? Because the boundary is decomposed not into simplices, but into quadrangles, okay? Or what I said with the wiggling a little, if I wiggle one of the vertices a little, then the combinatorics breaks, right? So if I move this a little, then it might go either this way or, or this way, all right? So when you say this, you mean that you consider the boundary of the polytope as, as a sphere? Yes. And this is the same f vector as your original situation? Yes. And it doesn't matter which simplicial sphere you start with? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If you have a, a simplicial sphere of dimension d minus 1, you find a, a polytope of dimension d, so that the sphere is again of dimension d minus 1, such that the face vectors are the same. So you can and have like over, this over z mod 2, you can have the Klein bottle. Yeah. Um, is it a simplicial sphere? No, it's not. I mean, it, right, it's not orientable, right? So there's no fundamental. Yeah. No, but you're oh, well. considering a simplicial sphere in terms of homology. Ah, if you wanted, to, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yes, 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 yes. Right. So the, the, the first homology vanishes. No, no, no. Yeah. No, 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 no. It, it doesn't have the, the right homology. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't have. Sorry, that's uh, surfaces. Yes, surfaces. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Poincaré sphere, you can. Right, right. Yeah, in surfaces, yeah, surfaces. There's no interesting example. Yeah. Mm. All right, um, but okay, so there's really an algebraic character condition that characterizes it. And now let me um, go and explain this algebraic characterization. Um, 
or at least I would start. Okay, let me use this one here. Mm. So over the course of, of, of the lecture, we will consider several rings, but they um, and several algebraic objects, but um, I will start with the most basic one um, that in some way is related to all of them. So these are now the basics. Um, so I start with delta simplicial complex. And um, I consider um, K any, any field. Um, just um, for convenience and simplicity later, let me assume that it's infinite. All right, so that things like normalization work. Mm. And then we can consider associated to the simplicial complex um, a rather simple ring, right? So I could consider the polynomial ring in several variables um, where I identify each of these uh, indeterminates with one of the um, vertices of my simplicial complex, okay? Identified. with um, the zero skeleton, so the zero dimensional, the vertices of delta, all right? So that's a complex that really doesn't contain much information per se, um, but then I can go on and consider um, a finer object, and this is k delta, um, and this is my original polynomial ring modulo an ideal that now encodes the combinatorics of the simplicial complex. That's the ideal generated by all those monomials that are not supported in my simplicial complex. All right. And then, well, OK. You want uh, monomials with something that is non, uh, not one. It is no monomials which are not the empty, where well, maybe you have a convention that they're empty. No, OK, OK. For, sim for me, simplicial complex is always down close. That makes also reduced homology much, much more nice. Right, it's, there's an empty face. Okay? okay, every simplicial complex um, has an empty face for me. All right, that's it. Um, then all these things work out much nicer. But yes, you're right. You have to worry about the empty set sometimes. And uh, of course, it's usually finite in your. Um, I, yeah. Okay. So yeah. Um, actually, so I, in the end, I want to go to infinite objects, but. Uh, for now, let's let's say with finite. You're right. Um, all right. And this now encodes the combinatorics quite nicely. So um, I can write down, for instance, well, I mean, it's a graded object, and I can write down the Hilbert function of this object. All right. And there are several nice ways of writing it. Um, let me give you the following. So let's assume that uh, delta is of dimension d minus 1. Then I can write this as 1 minus t to the minus d. And then the following sum. Oh, OK. So let me get this down a little. And then the following sum. Um, the i minus one dimensional faces 
um, times t to the i times 1 minus t to the d minus i. All right. Um, and there are several other ways. So, I mean, you can also, if you prefer to write it more directly, and actually, it's more, yeah, this I had to work out yesterday because I didn't remember it. I hope it's correct. Okay, that's what infinity for i equal one for i equals one with my convention to, to infinity. Um, that and uh, then it's k. Ah um, oh, no, I, zero. Um, k choose i. Um, f i minus one. So f i is zero. To is the same as before. F i is the same as before. It's just the number of faces of dimension um, i. All right? Because before it was independent set. Ah, OK, that's something. No, 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 no. There's. Ah, OK, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Um, this is. OK, so this is fi of delta. Yeah, in this context, it was independent set. I wanted to write some other letter, but i, i also didn't work. So maybe j, i, I don't know. Um, and so f minus 1 is, is uh, Yeah, I always write this with f minus 1 because it's more natural to think about the cardinality of a simplex in these contexts rather than the dimensions. But somehow the standard way is to write the dimension, so it's fi minus 1. All right. Um, but that's, of course, uh, um, an infinite dimensional object, right? It's somehow, as a ring, it's somehow, it's, somehow, um, it's infinite dimensional. It's about as a, as a vector space, I'm sorry. As a vector space, this is infinite dimensional. Um, as a ring, the cold dimension is, of course, finite. Um, and then what you do is, well, okay, so you have this phase ring. I mean, not um, make this any fuller and start something new here again. The cold dimension um, is finite. And it's, in fact, the cardinality of the maximal simplex, of a maximal simplex, all right? So the dimension of the complex plus one. Again, that's about the cardinality. Is, it's more natural, usually, to think about it. And then, well, often we want to consider the Athenian reduction of this object. So A of delta. And this is not quite well defined. So let me add a theta for the moment. Um, and this is, I take. the ring k delta, and I mod out by um, sufficiently many linear forms so that this becomes really um, of a cool dimension zero, so of finite dimension also the vector space. So the ideal generated by some linear forms. Right? It's, always, it's, it's, it's usually convenient to think of this right, as a matrix theta times the vector of indeterminates. All right. Um, that's okay. So now, okay, you can ask. What right, my natural question is to ask? Do you take the minimum on that? Huh? Do you take the minimum on that minimum? No, 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 no. I want to include Bertman fans. Yes, he, he spoilers a little. So Omid asked uh, whether I want to take the minimal number, but I purposely leave that out for now because I want to also include objects where, for natural reasons, you take a theta um, number of this, uh, in your um, form theta that is larger than um, just the cool dimension. Thanks. So theta is a, is a, is a, a matrix of... Uh... Yeah, you can think of theta as somehow a system of linear forms. I prefer to think of it as just a matrix with some entries in K, right, um, times the vector of indeterminates. All right. Why? Because, well, later we will think about this geometrically a little, and we think about the formation theory of some of these objects, and then it's useful to, to have a geometric perspective here. So you just cut it with a linear thing, okay? Yeah. And, you, and when you cut it, you want it to be uh, transfer, well, it in some sense. It to be zero dimensional. Yeah, okay, so let me give you the precise. Okay, so Maxim asked, and Gofer, in some way, they asked the same question. or. Maxim did not ask the answer. Um, um, when is this? 
when is this finite dimensional as a vector space, when is this of cool dimension zero as a quotient. And you can make it quite simple. Um, you can look at um, any phase. So, so this is finite. Oh, so the quotient is of cool dimension zero. Then zero if and only if for all faces sigma in um, my delta, so all simplices in my complex delta, um, I look at the columns corresponding to sigma. All right, so if sigma is of cardinality four, these would be four columns, and these would be the four columns associated to it. The associated columns, so now I look at theta restricted to um, the columns of sigma, and I look at the rank of this matrix. This has to be the same as the cardinality of sigma. Okay? So in particular, generic works. Okay? But we can be finer than that. And in fact, there will be situations where we really want to be very non-generic. Non All right? Okay. Um, so generic will decide whether you allow enough it's a matrix A by B. Well, the number of, of columns will be at least. Well, the number of columns is, um, well, you want it to be the, the, the number of vertices, right? Otherwise, right? So you want, right? So every, every vertex has its own column. column. Column was a vertical stuff, right? Column was a vertical stuff. You have to think of Rome or Athens. Um, and the number of rows that you need, right, the number of rows that you need here is at least uh, the cool dimension, so at least the cardinality of the maximal simplex. Well, right. Maybe I can rephrase. It's, yeah. it's a scheme for getting in the pots. It's a union of coordinate subspaces, yeah? And if you want to intersect with some other linear space to get yeah. just the point. Yes, yes, yes. Are you happy or <laughs> offer? I confused the, the matrix notation. It doesn't work. Okay, okay. Mm. All right. So let me go now to some topological restrictions that make this interesting. So. Actually, before we go on, may I ask you some simple yes. question? Yeah, this situation complex one can consider it's called as a collection of coordinate subspaces, yeah? Yeah. And is this... Uh, you can see, uh, is this quotient ring is the same as ring of functions? We had just to define this union of subspaces. You can see the polynomials. Yes, yes, we will get to this. Don't worry. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, you are spoiling. It's, uh, it's fine. I, I will not repeat it because, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, because it's a spoiler. Okay. Um, so let's look at um, an interesting case. Um, and this is, well, one of the nicest possible um, ring structures that we could have is, well, it could be called Macaulay. All right? K delta is called Macaulay. And then there are two interesting side facts. First of all, okay, so let me maybe remind everyone what the called Macaulay means. Well, it means that if I take theta, um, the length of theta, to be equal to the uh, cold dimension of the ring, then um, then this linear system of parameters um, is regular then theta is a regular 
system for k delta. Right? And that is somehow that's it's actually somehow that's a characterization. So that's a characterization of the core McCordiness, which means that, well, it means that uh, the multiplication by theta one, right? So very basic. If I take k delta and I multiply with theta one, then this map is ejective. And um, if I then look at the quotient by theta one and multiply with theta two, then this is ejective again. Um, and so on and so forth. All right, that's that's what it means to be called McCordy. Um, why is this nice? Um, well, let's look at the Hilbert function. All right, so uh, what happens if um, this multiplication is injective um, and I compute the Hilbert function? Well, what I do is really just the Hilbert in the Hilbert function of the quotient. Well, I'd, Every time I take quotient by one of these thetas, I deduct one, one rank from the other, right? The, the, I, I deduct whatever I have in degree k minus one from degree k, right? So um, what I can do is, well, I, I can write the original Hibbert function um, h of k delta t as, well, a polynomial h of t modulo um, one minus t to the d, and then the Hilbert the Hilbert function of this Artinian reduction associated to this theta delta theta. Put bracket one minus t two power d. Huh? Ah, thank you. Yes. Then this is just h of t. Is that a so called the so called h polynomial h vector? Um, so in particular, the coefficients are not negative. Yes, that's that's exactly the nice thing about it. Yeah. And not only no negative, but you also know that you cannot skip. You cannot have zero. Yes, 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 yes. Again, uh, okay. Again, off I spoiling things. I will not repeat it. Um, all right. Um, so Pierre, you're the boss. So we take, is a break planned or? Well, we started late, so. It's too early to take a break, but we could have a break in 15 minutes from now. Okay, okay. Um. Yeah. So let me continue a little bit. It's called Macaulay. Stuff. Okay, so now this is an algebraic condition, and you know that, okay, under this algebraic condition, um, you, you, you have some facts about the phase numbers, and the, in particular, first of all, you have the, some facts about the H numbers, but then you also have some facts about the H numbers, uh, sorry, before, then you also have some facts about the, the phase numbers of the original complex. Um, so, um, in this case, you can, for instance, in this case, you can compute h from f and vice versa via the following trick. You write down compute h as follows. And this is really just a Pascal triangle in reverse. So I take um, the empty face. Okay, that's just one. Um, then I have the zero dimensional faces, I have the one dimensional faces, and so on and so forth, up to the d minus one dimensional faces for d minus one dimensional complex. And then I want to fill in the entries here. So um, everything outside is zero, and this entry here, so the the top entry of the primitive that I don't have, the mo topmost entry that I don't have, is just the difference between this entry and this entry. And this is always the same. So this entry here in the middle, difference between this entry and this entry. 
Okay, so here I have one, one, up to two, up to two, one, one. Um, and here I have f0 minus one, and so on, and so forth. All right, so these are just nice entries. Okay, and then I, what I get in the end is here I get h0, so that's the, the constant coefficient of this h polynomial, right? Makes sense now because h0, that should be just the degree zero functions, which is just the, the field itself. Um, and then I have um, h1, which I can still write down, which is f0 minus the number of linear forms that I took out, so f0 minus d, and the, the rest is more complicated. So then you get h2 and so on and so forth. That's a way to compute it. So, and you see immediately that once you, now you, now you have the h numbers, right? You have, you have some facts that Ofer already told us, like they're always non-negative, there's no gaps in these, um, and you can transfer them back to the, to the face numbers as well because you can just do the same Pascal triangle in reverse, right? You can just sum them up. And what is nice here is, right, um, the, okay, so in this direction from face numbers to H numbers, okay, so these, the coefficients that I got were not, were not all non-negative, but if I go in the reverse direction, it's always a non-negative linear combination, right? So, for instance, if I want to bound the number of faces from below, the clever thing to do is to bound the h numbers from below. Right? To look at the algebra and what makes this algebra tick and how large does it have to be for algebraic reasons, and then automatically you get lower bound for the face numbers. All right? We will see nice examples of that. Um, you know, just, just the two ratings, does Cohen Macaulay fall off or is it so this Again with the spoilers, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay, so Maxim asked uh, whether there's a topological condition, and yes. Um, so here's the theorem of Hoster. Um, so k delta for delta d minus one dimensional simplicial complex. Colin Macaulay if and only if and let me use some new chalk um, for all sigma simply says in delta and again explicitly I, I, I'm including the empty face Okay, um, the link of um, sigma in delta, so let me write this as, these are the tau in delta, such that um, tau intersection sigma is empty, um, but tau union sigma is a simplex in I already know the simplicial complex. So, so you, you know, tau, tau not in delta, but the subset of the vertex. No, delta. Ah, ah, maybe, ah, maybe, yeah, it is in delta, delta actually, yeah. because the subset yeah. of the which is there. I'm just confused. Okay. Um, what was I? Ah, has homology. with k coefficients concentrated in dimension in dimension well I want the dimension of the complex all right d minus 1 minus a cardinality of the simplex that I took the link of all right so if you think about it this will be a simplicial complex um, which um, 
so the link, the link will be a simplicial complex um, which has homology just in the top dimension. You mean reduced homology? No, I don't mean because again there's an empty set, automatically reduced. <laughs> okay? So yes, but you should really <laughs> use you should really get used to think of the empty set as included, and then it's just the normal way of doing homology, and then I don't have to say it every time again. Um, all right. Um, right, okay, good. Um, the Tosser theorem, it's... Um, what? Yes. <laughs> I, I, uh, I think you should wear uh, several masks. So. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. so Maxim is spoiling again. Govenstein corresponds to the homology sphere case, yes. <laughs> oh, I was just joking. Um, okay, uh, which one is oldest? I think this one is oldest, okay. Oh, it's too easy going. And now I return to, to okay, so I will, I will skip uh, Maxim spoiler for now. I will, we will go there in a, in a minute. Um, now I will go to Ofer's spoiler for a second. Um, and state Macaulay's theorem. or really just a small part of it. So, let's say I want to characterize the phase vectors, the f-vectors of cohen macaulay complexes. Okay? F-vectors are equivalently small. What I want to really characterize are the h-vectors. Am I using this chalk wrong? F-vectors or h-vectors of simplicial complexes um, are characterized um, um, by Um, the Hilbert series polys of um, well of polynomial rings. So my commutative. What is h vector? Ah, um, h vector are the coefficients of the h polynomial. Oh, so sorry, um, h vector coefficients. Of h of t. You assume the square in Macaulay, no? Um, thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Of uh, Cohen Macaulay simplicial complexes. Cohen Macaulay simplicial complexes. Thank you. Um, of commutative uh, sort of graded algebras. Generated in degree one, which is just a fancy way of I take a polynomial ring. All right. Um, I mean, one direction we already saw. All right, um, because well, the, the 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 Hilbert series is such a polynomial. Okay, it has to satisfy. I mean, the non-trivial reason, the non-trivial direction now is I can in fact construct the simplicial call. For, for every, for every um, vector that I get this way, I can construct a simplicial complex as Cohen macaulay and has this yeah, as its h polynomial. I mentioned commutative gradient. Okay, fine, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, if it's infinite, yes, okay, you're right. 
But uh, yeah, anyway, we said finite for now. For, every, for now, everything is finite. Um, yeah. So you claim that if you have such an algebra, you have another one with the same dimensions, which occurs on a simplicial complex. Yes, yes. And this was proved by the, the Macaulay, whose name is... Yeah. Such, okay. Um. All right. Um. Okay, and that's okay. So this, this, that's that's the extent of. Um, Is it true that any commutative graded algebra can be deformed through the one kind of form? Um, okay, now it's now the question is what do you want? What do you allow as deformations? Yeah, so, so um, the deformation is a change of dimension. And yeah, yeah, um, uh, yeah. I don't know whether we'll get there, but there are operations like that. So, for instance, you can pass to the the generic initial ideal, and this will this you can realize. This is exactly the the way that Macaulay did it. And in fact, you can characterize. I mean, you can give a combinatorial. You can also write a combinatorial formula to to really describe the, the, the coefficients that you get here. But I will not go there, it's, it's not so, it's a tedious combinatorial formula. So the generic initial ideas m m means after that you actually allow action of the torus and take the limit in a certain way? Yes, 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 you can think of it like that. So these are also called the m-vectors here. So a short way of saying it is h-vectors are m-vectors and vice versa. These are also m-vectors from Macaulay. Okay. This is where m-vector means? I think it's just said for Macaulay. I don't think he named them the cells himself that way, although maybe he tried to find a... I don't, I don't, I don't remember. I don't think he called them m-vectors himself. I actually once bought the book of Macaulay, an old one. Is it in this book? The, the one... <laughs> you told me... <laughs> how would I know now? Um, I don't know. I don't know which book. Yeah. Um, like some some modular systems. Um, all right, I think this one is all this one. Let's just do without break. No, it's like okay. I mean it's fine. I mean, I mean it doesn't make sense to. I mean we end it. It's fine. Let's do it without break. Okay, let's have a five minutes break. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, good. Well, then we have a five minutes break. Whatever you want. <laughs> you want five minutes break? Yeah, okay, let's do five minutes break. I need a new coffee. Okay, so now we get to Maxime Spoiler. Oh, slowly we'll get there. So one important source of uh, spheres, I already mentioned, that's boundaries of polytopes. All right, in specific, specifically, simplicial spheres um, give rise to um, simplicial, uh, simplicial polytops give rise to simplicial spheres that way. Um, so let's consider that case. So sigma, that's for me the boundary now of a simplicial polytope. Um, and then what I can consider, well I can consider again this, this, this ring, this face ring associated to sigma but I can also do something that also Maxim hinted at. I can look at um, algebras of polynomials. Uh, there are various ways to think about it, but here's one way. So, so let's say, okay, so we have our, um, our simplicial sphere, and let's, let's just identify it with a fan over that sphere. So every single one of these faces, I just cone over, and I get, get a simplicial cone, and complete, Together, this, this forms a fan. Okay, so think of of sigma as a fan. So this is a deep polytope, and this is as a fan. Mm. Then we can consider the following algebra, p of sigma. And this is um, 
the algebra of cone-wise polynomial functions on this fan. So these are um, cone-wise polynomial functions on the ambient space. So if you want to think of this fan abstractly, it's cone-wise polynomial functions. Um, these are continuous functions on, 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 the, on the fan as somehow an abstract cone complex. Um, that when, rest when I restrict it to any of the simplices, I'm a polynomial. So this is like obvious real coefficients or? Yeah. If yeah. you have a real fund or if you have a rational fund, you take rational. I mean, let's, let's think of this all with real coefficients. Yeah, that's right, okay. I mean, we can, if I have a rational fund, I can think of rational coefficients, but it doesn't make, for me, let, let's go restrict to reals, all right? You are correct that if I, if I restrict to uh, rational fans, then what I get here is just the equivariant cohomology of the associated torque variety. Okay, so um, let's just say it. So if sigma are rational, then what we get, then P of sigma is just the equivariant cohomology. of this fan. Okay, and so it's rationally smooth. Um, yes, of, of x sigma, this is a torque variety of over, over this fan. So this is a, a complete torque variety because you have a complete fan. Yeah. And, if, and for other torque variety, it's also a the same description, like, ah, okay, yeah, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we will, when we got to, to matroids a little more, then we will get to this, exactly. exactly. Um, okay, P of sigma, um, this is the algebra of Conway's polynomials, of Conway's polynomials. Um, and it's naturally isomorphic to k of sigma. Oh, in this case, r of sigma. All right. Um, and how do I do this? Well, um, well, what are the generators of this algebra? Um, well, there are those functions um, that are non-trivial on one ray, right, of this, um, of, of, of the fan, and zero on all others. So for every ray here, let's say the, the, the ray of a vertex, the ray generated by a vertex of my superficial complex, right, I have the function uh, the co uh, the linear function, chi v, which is 1 on uh, v. All right, so it's linear and non-trivial on, on, this, on this ray, and 0 on all other rays. And when you wrote r of sigma, does it refer to the previous notation for a simplicial complex? Yeah. But you don't assume that sigma is simpli simplicial, or do you? Ah, uh, sorry, everything's simplicial for now, sorry. Yes, thank you. Okay. I, I said it, but I didn't write it, sorry. Um, okay, and then the, the, this isomorphism is just given by sending this characteristic function of the ray to the corresponding um, the corresponding variable, and that's it. Um, in this way, I also get characteristic functions on every face, all right? If I multiply... Yeah, it's easy to see that there is a map in the other direction. Yeah. And uh, then we can claim that this is, it is, uh, yeah. it is uh, bijective. 
which is not completely. Yeah, it's maybe a little exercise, but it's not a it's not a difficult one. Yeah, it's not. Um, yeah, you're right. You're right. It's a mal. Okay, maybe then the the, the it was, would be more natural to to write it in in the other direction. But anyway, it's an isomorphism. Um, Anyway, what we get is also the characteristic functions um, of faces, of simplices, all right? And those are um, non-trivial on one simplex, all right? Non-trivial and of degree equal to the cardinality of the simplex. And um, there are zero everywhere else, all right? Zero everywhere apart from the, from the immediate neighborhood of the simplex. And just, they're just defined as a product over v and sigma v. Okay, so these are the characteristic functions that generate every graded component. All right, um, that's that's all good and nice. So this is uh, the algebra, and then I have corresponding to um, the Artinian reduction. All right, so now again, this is a covariant cohomology. So what I want is um, a finite dimensional vector space, right? We want to, I want a section again, and well, what I can do in this case very naturally is p of sigma um, and mod out the ideal of the global linear functions, right? So these are the kind of the boring functions, global linear functions, right? So these are the boring degree one functions. I mod out the idea generated by them. That's nice. And this is, okay, so this is isomorphic to A sigma. Mr. And okay, so what is this, uh, the theta now that I associated with this? Well, I mean, I naturally have coordinates for these vertices here in Rd, all right? Every single one of these vertices has a coordinate. And I normed my characteristic function in this way, that it is one on this coordinate. So um, where theta um, is given by the vertex coordinates, in Rd. So here's a hint that uh, we will think about this uh, a little more geometrically, even though um, in general we won't think about fans so much. Okay, but this is kind of, that's a way to get a nice geometric interpretation. All right. Mm. And now again, so now we now we go exactly to to, to the spoiler that um, uh, Maxim gave earlier. So we, we want to say that somehow these algebras are even nicer than just Cohen Macaulay. Okay, um, and here's um, a one important fact in this in this direction. Let me actually use a new blackboard. Um, let me use this one here. So a theorem. In the general, in the most general form, um, um, actually, yeah, it's not. I think it's also due to Hoster, but it's sometimes not clear because Hoster did many things that were not quite written down by Hoster. Um, and this is Poincaré duality, or if you want to think about it in in other in a commutative algebra language, then this is Gorenstein property. Um, and let me write attribute this to Hoster. Um, in the most general case. So sigma, again, um, the boundary of a polytop, boundary of a polytop of a polytop, or more generally, Uh, K homology sphere uh, 
Um, then um, the degree, ah, oh, let me write on, of dimension, of dimension d minus 1. Um, then the degree, um, the degree d component of this ring is isomorphic. Well, in the boundary of polytop case, I don't have much choice. But in the more general case, I can just say, OK, so then I, I look at this over a field. Um, and I can write k here. Um, and right, what I can do now is I can write down a pairing. I can write down a pairing between degree k and degree d minus k. This goes to degree d. And this pairing is perfect. This pairing is perfect. OK? So we really have a nice Poincare duality algebra. And this works um, really in a context, in a, in, a, in a context that is much larger than just um, just the case of polytopes, right? So this immediately you can generalize to spheres. We will see a proof that is um, much simpler than the one that is usually or classically used, um, but probably not today. All right, but um, so when you say cohomology, so that before that globally, that locally the links are, are and all the world thing are the same homology as yes, exactly. So the top homology, right? Cole Macaulay means that the homology, if it exists, or cohomology, if it exists, is, is concentrated in the top. And now I want it to be one dimensional every time. For all the links and for the whole thing. Yes. Right, so um, so homology sphere. Let me let me write it down. Here. K homology sphere. Um, it means for me that um, the if I look at of dimension d minus one means that it's called Macaulay and the um, if I look at the homology of um, the link of sigma in small sigma and big sigma um, in dimension d minus 1 minus the cardinality of sigma. This is, and again with k coefficients, um, this is just isomorphic to the ground field. This, is, this gives both the links and the wall thing. Okay. Yeah. And for the coin you also needed all those. Yeah, yeah. It's about coin macaulayness is included. Okay. So it's coin macaulay plus this. Okay, so it's concentrated at the top, right? But additionally, I, I say, okay, the top homology must be just one dimensional for all sigma in, uh, in delta, right? Like this. I'm sorry, may I have a question? Yes. Uh, so you said that this AD is one dimensional, and uh, so I suppose the higher dim uh, like the you know AD plus one and all and the other subspaces, they are all zeros, right? Yes, yes, that's right. And can Can you explain this? Why Why, why this is true? At, at least on on this level of, of um, polynomials. I will now basically give you a way to compute um, a computer ring in the case of 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 the boundaries of polytops. All right, and then um, um, next time we will see how to do this more generally, OK? But I mean, if you want, it follows already from um, this formula for the H polynomial that I gave, all right? 
I told you write down these face numbers on the um, on the diagonal and then use this inverse Pascal trick to compute the H polynomial, right? Which is basically just, I mean, every time I took an Artinian reduction, every time I, I took a I took out a linear form, I just I deducted one rank from another. So that's the formula that comes out. And there you see that the top non-trivial coefficient is D, right? H D. That's it. Okay, so that's one way of seeing it. Now I will do the uh, geometric argument. Okay, good. Mm. So let me let me try to give an, a geometric intuition. Um. Um. So let's look at. Okay, let let me introduce a notion. So let me call, um, let's consider a simplicial complex delta. Um, and um, this is a simplicial complex of dimension d minus 1. And I call it shellable. Um, well, if um, d minus 1 is equal to 0, or, okay, so if it's higher dimensional, I have to say something non-trivial, so it, or it is, a, or delta um, is a d minus 1 simplex, all right, so delta is really just one simplex of dimension d minus 1, or there exists F a d minus one simplex in delta such that another two choices, uh, not two choices, such that uh, two two conditions. So I can look at the simplicial complex delta induced on the remaining facet. So delta minus f. So this is the complex induced by induced by the remaining facets um, or which is a d minus one simplices um, this complex has to be shallowable again is shallowable and delta minus f intersection f is shallable of co-dimension one. All right. So here, do you assume that uh, the Every simplex is contained in a simplex of uh, dimension d minus one. Is it part of your? It's not a part of the definition of simplicial complex. But when you say that you look only the maximal dimensional facet to, the, to define delta minus. Yeah, in particular, it has to be. Except in particular, it will be pure. It will be of every simplex. Every maximal simplex will be of the same dimension. That's right. So because in this sense, it's simplex. It will become practical. Yeah. No, 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 no. It will. It could be a sphere. Um, so let me give an example, right? I mean, it's a the boundary of this triangle, right? If I take out this face, it, the intersection is of co-dimension one and shallable again. Yeah. Union. Yeah. Well, the implication is that it's always called Macaulay. It's in fact homotopy Macaulay, so it's the strongest form of Macaulay. So this implies that delta is called Macaulay. But, uh, but you only really need something. Uh, it seems to me that you are you're, you're using a situation where you have a sphere. Then it should be like, like it's, it's another one. The, 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 the one that you remove, the f that you remove in the beginning, will touch the other ones with all its. In all its no, no, no. So this is why I take. Delta minus f, this is the, the, the simplicial complex induced by the remaining facets. So all the other facets. So let me, let me give you an example. So 
Um, so this complex and this complex. Okay. Um, if I remove, if I take this phase here, right, and I remove it, what I have left is a complex induced by the remaining facets, and the remaining facets is this and this. And the intersection, right, so the intersection of F with this here is, so the intersection is exactly this phase. So, indeed, this is shellable, or at least, at least I can do the first step of the shelling. And you mean pure co-dimension one, when you say co-dimension one? It's shellable. Shellable in particular would imply pure. It is shellable again. It's, it's shellable of the... Okay. Of pure, if it's a collected component and stuff. Like yeah, yeah, okay, so it's, it's in the boundary of the simplex. You're right, it's not really needed. It's, it's equivalent to say just it's pure of co-dimension one, that's right. But let's, let's leave it with the shellable of the co-dimension one. That's fine. Johanna, you look skeptical? Well, depending on how you read the first bit, purity follows or doesn't. Do you mean that you define the facet to be exactly the d minus one simple piece? Then it's a bit fishy. If you say, the um, remaining facets, I Ah, uh, OK. You're right. You're right. You're right. OK. Yeah, yeah. OK, so. OK, so. Let me, let me just say pure, it's fine. It's, um, um, pure of dimension uh, complex, uh, pure of dimension, um, d minus one. Um, and pure means all maximal faces, which are called the facets are of the same dimension. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now pure is part of the definition. Yeah, but uh, the concerning the second condition, what I meant is it like you have an example, like you have those two uh, triangles that, are, that uh, have a face in common, then you take another one which has a vertex in common with one of them. And then, if you remove the, the middle one, it intersects, the rest intersects it with the two components. So, one of them is co-dimension one and Yeah, I mean, I, you mean I could, I could also remove this face first? No, no, no. In the, and I draw another thing with two, those two, and another one that touches, touches in the, 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 no, the other vertex, the, the, this one, which yeah. only touches there, yeah. some triangle there. And then you remove it, you remove the middle triangle. Yes. What the intersection of delta minus f with f will be disconnected. Yes. And it will be shareable. No, it will not be pure. So now we make pure. Ah, all right. Because you shareable should be. Ah, okay. Now you put it back. Yeah. Okay. You make, you make the. Everything that, okay. Yeah. So your, your initial comment. Yeah, 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 thank you. Um, anyway, this complex then is, is not shareable, right? I, if, I, I, if I try to remove this face, then obviously the, no, I'm of co dimension two, right? The intersection with whatever remains is of co dimension two. All right, um, yes. It's always. Um, so is it with a shareable is either contractible or like a sphere? It's always homotopy called Macaulay, yes. which means that it's homotopy equivalent to a wedge of spheres in particular. It's a wedge of spheres of dimension the dimen equal to the dimension of the complex. Okay, and that also applies locally. Yeah, so it's common Macaulay with respect to homotopy even. Is it the same as what Hofstra defined in one of his early papers? He, 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 put, he put something on shallow burn. Um, 
Maybe I confuse it with something else, but I think. I mean, this ocean, this notion is rather old. It goes back to Whitehead, so okay. um, I, I don't remember Hossa. I'm sure Hossa talked about shallability once, but by then well, this, this notion was already standard. I mean, it comes from PL topology usually. It comes from PL topology. Oh. PL topology. PL topology. Yeah, so. Um, so what's the role? Some synthetic tools, some convenient tool for geometry to reduce coin macaulays. What's the role of it? Mm. Sorry? Why explain us? Okay, okay, let me, okay, so. I, to answer Jan's question, essentially, and to explain a little Poincare duality, I will tell you. Okay. Um, again, you want to, you're already at the spoiler, yes. Um, what is the oldest part? I think this part is the oldest, right? So, for delta shallable, um, well, we can, we can compute, right, somehow, if delta is shallable, then in particular we have some facet that we can re remove. Um, so F, the facet removed in shelling step. Um, what we can do is, well, we can look at the ring A of delta, all right? Um, with respect to, um, yeah, so let me, um, A of delta with respect to theta, um, the linear system of parameters, or, right, so these are linear forms of number, so the length equal to the cold dimension. And I can look at um, the restriction of A delta to A delta without F, without this facet. Okay? So I have my simplicial complex delta, and I look at the restriction to delta without F, right? So I move one, I, I basically look at one shelling step. And then the point is that this kernel here, of this map is generated by a single phase, x sigma f. Oh, let me write it as a correct, let me write it as x because we are in the ring picture, in the phase ring picture, not in the, in the converse polynomials. Um, where sigma f is the minimal phase simplex of f not in um, delta without f. So theta, what is your theta? So number of linear forms is equal to? The cool dimension. So I'm not in this case where I take out more linear forms than the cool dimension. Ah, ah, so it's kind of depends on the generic parameters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Secretly, yeah. Yeah, secretly it depends on it, yeah. All right. Mm. And now we can actually prove Poincaré duality in this case where sigma is a boundary of a polytope in a rather easy way. Um, uh, uh, so is this not epimorphism? Okay. Yes, this is always this is always subjective. Um, well, I mean, why? We are, we are just restricting somehow, if you think about it as conwise polynomials, right? we're just restricting to a subspace. It's, yeah. So Shellable doesn't get me if we are in a coin or coin situation, or does it? Shellable means coin Macaulay automatically. It, 
as I said, it even means homotopy called Macaulay. Shallable, shallable is automatically called Macaulay. The other way around is not true. But there is a condition of the global homology. Yes. Okay, so if you, okay, this is a condition on the global homology, of course, that is immediate, but um, you. It's not. Ah, oh, there's no field. No, I don't, I don't see. That's the point. It's, it's immediately called Macaulay over all fields. It's homotopy called Macaulay, even. It's a wedge of spheres globally, and the, there's a lemma or it's more a little proposition that you can prove that if you're shallable, then the link of every face, this uh, link sigma, it's also shallable. Yeah, but wedge of spheres, so the top one is... Ah, okay, you don't dimension... Uh, it's just... Okay, okay. Yeah. A little uh, confusing again. Okay. <coughs> so it's independent of the... Of the okay. Ah, so the, sh the shilling gives some kind of you order basis, yeah? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. That gives us, yeah. Um... What was the oldest one now? Maybe this one, I don't know. Actually, not this one. So. So, if sigma is a boundary of a polytope, then sigma is shallable. Okay, that's um, the theorem, and it's somehow, it's nice as proved by a picture, it's very easy. So let's say we have a polytope, and then we have a little we have a little moon program on it or a little rocket program. Um, you know, there's a rocket on one of these faces here, and then you just shoot this rocket off in a generic direction, and you note the the continents or the simplices of the polytope as as they come into view. All right. So I mean, you start here, so that's the first one, and then you just start in a generic direction, and maybe then this one comes into view first. And at, uh, at some point this, and it's a very ambitious rocket program, so it reaches infinity, and it comes back from the other direction, and when you come back from the other direction, you count the faces in the order that you lose sight of them. So maybe, all right, so it goes there, and then here, and then um, I would lose sight of this here first, four, then five, and at some point I crash land here, six. Or maybe it, it's not a crash landing, but it, that, that doesn't matter. Um, all right, and that's a shading. And um, it's not hard to see that any, any shelling of a sphere has a property that you can turn it around, it's again a shelling of a sphere. Okay, um, in particular here with the rocket program, it's trivial because you can just go in the other direction with the rocket. Um, um, and the reverse shelling is a shelling as well. is a shelling as well. Uh, and so this is true for any shelling, not necessarily the rocket type. I mean, the rockets don't give you all the shellings, or...? Um, no, 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 they don't give all, all the shellings. These are special, the, these rocket shellings, yes. But, in, but for any of the shelling, the reverse is still shelling. Not yes, for any shelling, the reverse is still a shelling. If it's a shelling of a sphere. A sphere means a... Uh, uh, okay, so here's a, here's a fact. If you, if, you are a, if you are a homology sphere and you're shallable, or your homology manifold, and you're shallable, then you're automatically either a PL sphere, so PL homeomorphic to the, to, to the boundary of the simplex, or a PL ball. Those are the only situations, okay? Um, why? Well, you, you, can, you can think of this, every shelling step induces a PL homomorphism, except the last one, right, um, where, you, where you complete the sphere, and that's it. All right, so that's a kind of, if you want, it's... 
So a shareable homology manifold with any coefficient yeah. is either a PL sphere or a PL yeah. mold. Okay. Shareable class homology manifold implies that you are a sphere, PL sphere. Homology sphere. Uh, homology manifold depends on if you. PL sphere means. Doesn't matter. PL sphere in the PL equivalent to the normal, to the usual sphere, yeah? Yes, yes. So it doesn't matter what field you, you start over. Ah, so it will become automatic. Yeah, automatically. And so it's either a PL sphere or a PL ball. You don't get any other objects. So if it's small, if it's closed, it's, uh, it's a sphere, otherwise it's a ball. Okay. I mean, it's a side fact. It's not so important for us. Why can't I get a different, a higher wedge? Because a wedge will be not a, a wedge will not be a manifold in general. You will need a wedge point. Um, that's it. All right, um, and now we can prove Poincaré duality in a rather easy way. And how do you get a shellable thing which is? Equivalent to a wedge of, of spheres. So what is an example? Well, it's the, okay. So, so Ofer asked uh, whether there's a shell. How do I get a shellable thing that is a wedge of spheres? And here's an example, like this. Right? It's like two triangles, two, two boundaries of a triangle, two one spheres, just put together at a point. This is shellable and the wedge of spheres. Ah, because we can delete each one. Okay, yeah, of course. Um, and now why, okay, so why can I, why do I, why do I have Poincaré duality? Well, this tells me that um, when I, okay, so if I have an element alpha in um, A over K of sigma, right? That's a, that's a formal combination of, um, of monomials um, of degree k, right? And at some point, I, I have enough monomials here in the shelling to write it, right? Uh, I have all the monomials I need to write this element. And then, um, let's say this, this, this happens exactly at the shelling step, right? So now this happens, so now, um, is writable in shelling step f. Um, F, meaning the facet that I remove in, uh, along the shelling. So maybe, maybe this here, in this, in this shelling step, F. Is what? Writable. You can write it. It's more, you, you have enough generators. You have, right? So this here generates my algebra, right? Completely. And at some point, I, I have, you, you have your favorite element, right? You want to prove Poincaré duality, right? You want to have, for, 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 for the given element alpha in degree k, you want an element beta in degree d minus k, such that alpha times beta in degree d is non-trivial. Yeah. Right? That's the pairing is perfect. That's what I want to prove. Yeah. Okay. All right? So it is, suppose alpha is... Okay, so alpha in, in a k, right? So that's the element I want to... That's the mystery element that I want to find. Alpha is the mystery element that I want to find the pairing element for. I want to pair it in some way. Yes. Yeah? And at some point, so okay, so now I know how to generate, how to give a basis of my ring in terms of, in terms of the shelling, right? I know that there exists a shelling now because I'm in the situation of a boundary of a polytope. And I know that I can generate uh, a nice basis for this ring. And at some point, I, I will have enough elements together to write this element alpha, okay? I will have enough elements, enough monomials of degree k to write this element. So, so this, you get filtration, yeah? Not, not basis, yeah? Um, bunch of epimorphisms? Yes. Algebras are without basis because it depends on hidden parameters, the thetas, yeah? Um, yeah, 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 exactly. So the theta, I mean, so fi I fix theta. I fix the theta, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, but it's kind of parameters. It's hard to choose generic parameters in sense. No, no, no. But I gave you a condition. What is a good choice? I gave you a condition. What is a good choice? Yeah. Right? And I, I fix a specific choice of parameters. Yeah. 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 Um, Which world did you write? Is what? Is writable. Like it's small. Well, it's okay. So maybe writable is not the best word here. The loop is chance of filtration. Um. So you want to write it in terms of the the. Okay. Simplices that you already removed, or the, the leftover simplices? What is In it? terms of the simplices that are left, all right? All right, I, I can, yeah, it's all right. I, I, I remove the facets one by one, all right? All right? Every time I do this, the kernel of what I have to what I have left after the removal step is one dimensional. Right. Okay. Yeah. Is one yeah, dimensional? Yeah. Operation was one dimensional step, and alpha is non-zero gives non-zero yeah. vector in one one yeah. dimensional space. Okay. Ah, it is one exactly one dimensional. Exactly one. Exactly one dimensional. Complete flag. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly one dimensional. There's just, it's really just the multiples of this one element associated to the shading step. Okay. So each yeah. time you. You have, and then writable means that you want to write in terms of those guys in the kernel, or in terms of the, those guys. Exactly, in, in those in those guys, in terms of those guys that I have here in the kernel, right? That, that's right. You already lost when you shell. In other words, you want it to go to zero in shelling step k. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay. Right? Okay, so now, okay, so now, what do I do? Right, I have this element alpha, and I have my shelling step f. All right, and now I can turn around the whole shelling. All right, the shelling turned around is again a shelling, and I look again what happens at this it is in this step f. All right, so the last okay, so alpha is a linear combination of things plus let me uh, say a co co coefficient that appears in the last step, and this is exactly the last step that it appears. Um, lambda sigma f um, x sigma f. Right? And I don't care about this. I don't care about this part. So alpha is equal to this. All right? And now what do I do? I multiply this, right? So the, 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 I pair this with, I pair this times, um, okay, I, I define beta to be exactly x f without sigma f. Why is it the right choice? This is exactly, um, right, so if, if in my shelling sigma f was the minimal phase of f that is not, um, that is not in, the, in, the, in the remaining part, then if I turn it around, if I, turn the, if I turn around the shelling, what is left in the, in, the, in, the, in the reverse shelling is exactly the complement of sigma minus f in f. Yeah? That's it. And now I pair these two, right? And what I get is exactly a degree, okay, so this here is of degree k, then Right, so degree k, which means that this here is of, right, well, this is of cardinality sigma f is of cardinality k. This here will exactly be of the complementary degree, this element here. And alpha, then in this way of writing it, alpha times beta, which will be exactly um, lambda sigma f times x sigma f times x f without sigma f, which is just the same as lambda sigma f times xf, and this here is non, not zero. All right? And that's it. Now, in this way, you have geometrically proved the Poincaré duality for the case of the boundaries of polytopes. All right? That's it. Um, OK. Um, I think I, I, I used too much time on this. Um, how much longer do we have? Uh, well, it's short, right? so yeah. Yeah. 
negative 30 minutes. All right. Um, all right. Uh, so now we have Poincaré duality for this. Um, I think. Um, we started late, but then. Yeah, we started late, but I don't know whether people have to leave. So, Pierre, you're the boss. Yeah, okay, okay. So we continue on, or we continue on, on Wednesday. Uh, okay. All right.